It's a way of life that dates back more than 2,000 years. The dance is in the song. Tell the stories. The stories of Point Hope, an Inupiaq village of less than 700 residents, located 200 miles north of the Arctic Circle. A spit of land said to be the longest continuously inhabited area in North America. We've been right here hunting, gathering, dancing, singing for thousands of years. The history is here. For more than 2,500 years, several different settlements on the northwestern edge of Alaska have called this land home, taking advantage of its abundant resources. The seal, the beluga, the walrus. This is our way of living. This is the way we feed our communities. All are vital to the survival of the Inupiaq in a subsistence way of life. But the bowhead whale is among the most important. The whale is our identity as a people. You know, we, um, it, it makes us who we are. Identity and a strong traditional and cultural presence in Alaska for centuries. They're our shelter, our clothing our food, our spirituality as a people. Um, without the animals, we're not. A spirituality and identity that can be felt and seen just about everywhere. And despite the fact that most of the original village was lost. 97% of the village is out in the ocean. It's eroding. Strong winds and rough seas pummel the coast daily claiming the Inupiaq's land. However, those same rough seas also provide for life here. It's a strong bond the community shares and celebrates with the whale. We celebrate the fact that it gives itself up to us so that we can uh, continue the cycle. Despite the constant erosion, a few cultural sites remain, like the ceremonial feasting grounds where the residents of Point Hope come together for three days every June to celebrate. And there's their whale graveyard, where bowhead's jawbones line the horizon, the larger bones serving as headstones for whaling captains that have passed away. This is a, a whale, a sigalok, an isolate. Despite age-old traditions like these, the Inupiaq are also incredibly adaptive as they rely on earthly provisions for nearly everything, including the permafrost underground. Ice cellars have been carved to store each family's meat. This was Daryl Franklin's ice cellar, a willing captain that passed away several years ago. And cellars are passed down through generations, some hundreds of years old. Down inside the ice cellar, the walls are lined with hundreds of bowhead whale jawbones. The floor is lined with whale blubber that's dripping fat onto the ground. It's created a pool about a couple inches deep. Family traditions, culture, experience, and community run deep. The one common denominator they share is the whale. Residents here say decades of commercial whaling during the 1800s drastically reduced the number of bowhead whales and nearly wiped out this community. The population dropped down to 126 from a population that used to be well over 4,000 people right here in Point Hope. But tough challenges are something the Inupiaq are used to. Life is a cycle in this deeply rooted native community and learning to adapt to change is a necessity. There are only a few constants here, tradition, culture, and the whale. For thousands of years, the Aleut people have called this land home, an isolated village surrounded by ocean and volcanic mountains that has created a turbulent and dangerous situation. Days like this don't come around too often here. While the days are long, summers in this fishing village tucked away in the heart of the Aleutians are short. For some, it's a time to play, okay. while others are busy at work. It's become more and more of a desperate situation. Bonita Babcock has worked as an EMT and a community health aide at the local clinic for 10 years. I, I, I love people. I, I love to be able to help people. But Babcock can't always help. 
her love has turned to desperation. All we're asking for is safe access. King Cove officials say over the past 30 years, at least 19 lives have been lost. Eight out of 10 times they can't make it in here. They point to the lack of an access road as the reason, pushing for a road that would connect King Cove, Cold hey. Bay, and the only all-weather airport in the area. It's sickening that the only thing standing between my patient and getting them on a medevac to Anchorage is this little, this little piece of connective road. Babcock says in the winter, winds can reach up to 100 miles per hour, creating whiteout conditions. Weather so bad that they say the Coast Guard sometimes refuses to fly. Oh. A situation that Walter Wilson says almost cost him and his baby their lives earlier this year. I was just wondering if we are going to make it or not because I couldn't see nothing and it was blowing. There's hardly anything to see with all the snow blowing around. Wilson was crushed by a 600 pound crab pot while fishing for cod, dislocating both of his legs and fracturing one of them. While waiting to be medevaced to Anchorage, his six week old son Wyatt stopped breathing. Despite their dire situation, Help couldn't come for hours. It took me about 12 hours because uh, I got in that night about 6 or 7 o'clock that night or something. And it took me until 9 o'clock the next morning to finally make it out after he was medevaced out the first flight. Recognizing the problem decades ago, it wasn't until 2008 when King Cove began building a gravel road that winds along the coastline, stretching from the airstrip to the edge of the Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge. That project was completed in 2013. The original plan to utilize a $9 million hovercraft to transport patients to Cold Bay didn't work because of high winds and seas. It's good road, it's good traveling road, it's gravel, it's one, you know, one lane with the pullout, so people are able to get two vehicles by each other if you need to. After about an hour of driving along the 17 mile road, we have finally reached the point of contention. The place where the road ends and the debate between human life and wildlife begins. A debate that longtime King Cove resident Della Trumbull finds insulting, as Secretary of the Interior Sally Jewell recently ruled in favor of protecting the wildlife refuge, denying King Cove the road they are desperate to complete. In my mind, there's no reason we should be having this discussion. People's lives should be more important than the birds. But just across the lagoon, Gary Ferguson of Cold Bay sees things a little differently. All communities within the state of Alaska are faced with the same issue. Uh, most of them, the only access is by air. With King Cove right now, currently, they have two. It doesn't make much sense to uh, develop a third, especially with that area that's a unique, one-of-a-kind area. Gary says he wouldn't object to the road if there weren't any other viable options, saying King Cove residents have a hidden agenda. The uh, real reason is they want a place to drive their vehicles in the evening, just like we do here in Cold Bay. After more than 35 years, controversy continues to rage on. I feel frustration. Um, it's like you can reach out and touch, touch Cold Bay. A lifeline that for the time being remains just out of reach. Following the Department of Interior's rejection of the road, the King Cove residents and the state of Alaska have filed a lawsuit to reverse that decision. In King Cove, Blake Essig, Channel 2 News. My mom and dad, my brother, my two boys, my sister and her daughter. For more than 60 years, Three Saints Bay Orthodox Church has been a part of Walter Stanley's family and picturesque Old Harbor, Alaska, which is set against emerald waters and snow-capped mountains. The church's light blue colored roof and cupolas overlook this fishing village of more than 200 people on Kodiak Island's southeastern shores. Built in 1952, the Warsaw Hall was just over a decade old when a devastating 1964 earthquake struck and Stanley was only a child when a terrifying tsunami engulfed his entire town that fateful night. Some days like Russian Christmas coming up, standing room only in here. 
Walter Stanley couldn't tell us much about what some of the symbols inside the church mean, just that it's a place the lifelong Old Harbor resident has worshipped at since he was a child. A place where Alaska's Russian and Lutte cultures come together. Built in 1952, Stanley says the worship hall has changed very little since he was a child, even after the devastating quake of 64. It was like jet taken off when it first hurt the wave. Villagers knew trouble was brewing when the bay between Sidolitic Island and Old Harbor started to recede away from the town at first. They scrambled for cover on the hillside nearby. It measured at 33 feet. After the tsunami? Yeah. 33 feet. That's how much the tide come in. Our biggest tide used to be 9 foot or 10 foot. It's almost half the fleet. The tsunami claimed the life of only one Old Harbor resident that night, a miraculous reality given the amount of destruction it caused. Stanley won't say if he believes in divine intervention, but Three Saints Bay Orthodox Church was the only building left standing after the massive wave receded. Well, the water was all around the church. Next morning, the caretaker, there was two caretakers come down, come in with them. There was a couple candles on the floor, but there was no water in there. A huge tsunami generated by the tremor. But what the tsunami didn't take away from Three Saints Bay back in 1964, time has. The church's priest left Old Harbor due to health issues. The congregation is now smaller. Stanley worries the church is facing a tidal wave of another sort a younger, secular generation of residents. With the young age coming up, they, they don't go to church much. Younger people. But the older people come to church. Now a church elder himself, Walter Stanley can't help but to reminisce this time of year. For Simon, Alaska, Adam Pinsker, Channel 2 News. The cool end of summer breeze blows along the shores of the Homer Spit. Sunday marks the end of the tourist season in Homer. It's a time for residents to relax and enjoy a decade long tradition. There is really no set answer for it. Every person that's here has a different reason for being here. It's Homer's 10th year of the community art project, The Burning Basket. A creation meant to strengthen neighborhood bonds, an experience that offers personal reflective healing. Itself sort of represents the weaving of the landscape around us. The basket is made from natural materials gathered in Homer, but it also holds much more. I feel like I also like them in taking advantage of a very rare opportunity to come together with the community, to celebrate the creative process, to understand that this art is impermanent, I think heightens people's awareness. It makes them want to be here because they know the sculpture is not going to be here tomorrow. Mavis Mueller calls herself a migratory artist who brings this burning basket to many different communities across the country. This year's theme, Enjoy, could be seen all throughout the basket's art. That's mine right here. It's just a uh... In an envelope. Peter was born and raised in Homer, and he says he has always appreciated the remedial power of the burning basket. It's just an opportunity for you to just write out everything that's bothering you and then just pitch it into the fire and watch it all sort of disappear. This is Peter's first year to see his part of the basket burn away. A worry he hopes to eternally forget but a moment he hopes to always remember. Molly Algren, Sitka Volunteer Fire Department, November 30th, 2004, when a firefighter had died in the line of duty, paying the supreme sacrifice, it was the mournful toll of the bell that solemnly announced a comrade's passing. At a time where there was so much national attention to Patriot Day, Many here in Anchorage paid their respects to Alaskan firefighters who gave their all in the name of honor. Today we pause on one of the most somber days in America's history to collectively pay tribute, remember, honor, thank 
and celebrate the lives of the 30 Alaskans that have perished in the line of duty. We pause to remember all those who have given their life and service. We pay honor to those today who gave the ultimate sacrifice. It was a memorial service that centered around Alaskans, but it was one that honored the fallen of 9-11 with a firefighter symbol of its own. But if you look behind me, there's two towers built out of ladders, and there's a, and that's what 9-11 is all about. Many say 9-11 is about remembering those who paid the ultimate sacrifice. And even though 12 years have passed, many agree 9-11 gives Americans an identity they still hold today. I don't think uh, society is forgetting. Uh, I think uh, it, it becomes a part of who we are and a part of what we are. Uh, you know, there, there have been significant events throughout history that, that may have been forgotten, but uh, I do think they become a part of who we are as a society. Not far from Larry Meyer's front door. Well, where the hell is, how come the, the I don't understand. A view of what he hopes doesn't get too close. He watched the Funny River fire crest the ridge last night. Friends and neighbors like Buck Carroll have been streaming in to see what's happening with the fire. So yeah, it, it has gotten quite a bit closer even since I've been here this morning and a lot closer since last night. They also do what they can to help. At least it'll stop the hot embers from starting anything. Larry and the others cleared trees when the fire started getting big. But it keeps stalling around. You always told four years ago about that roof and those trees. And did I do anything? No. On this lot, this former fisherman collects wooden fishing boats and Swedish style log cabins. But this ain't looking good. <laughs> Larry doesn't have insurance. Before, he worried packing up his teak furniture from Thailand would damage it. And now, so, I don't want to damage it so it'll probably burn up in the house. You know, it's funny what you think of you that you start worrying about when there's a fire. This property holds mementos of an adventurous life. He uses money and he travels to, to strange places, you know. He'll go out in the woods of Cambodia to see the temples and, you know, the, the back country. This adventure is one that Larry hopes he can soon put behind him. Uh, Larry, you're going to be all right. Well, maybe. No, I think you are. Come look at where the flames are now. The moment I decided to forgive, I had been corresponding for seven months in letters. And starting anything, uh, you have butterflies. and We went out and, and held community meetings throughout my district, the first in the state. You know, I think it's an important part of the process. I believe it is important enough to go into special session. Allocated costs for improvements to our highways. And we ran, um, I think, five or six amendments in the Resources Committee. $400 per student increase would have allowed us to rehire some of the staff I've been working every day with uh, legislators. The bill with all the language in it, and we will take a, a look at the language. That would have been a good uh, interim uh, task force uh, project. The administration a sense of, of what the legislature wants. Right now, the Judicial Council is made up of three attorney members. In Oklahoma they are, but in Alaska I don't believe many people will pay the toll. Most school districts uh, are not complaining and they really shouldn't be. I mean, planning to sell assets while we were debating the oil tax bill. That was the Senate's attempt. The Senate's attempt, obviously this is a compromise bill. 